in this video, we're going to talk about scope, ethics, and the code of conduct. Probably not the most exciting part of this course, but important nevertheless. So let's start off with the scope. The scope defines the range of assets that an organization is explicitly inviting researchers to assess for vulnerabilities. If something is out of scope, it means the asset is explicitly off limits for testing. If you're looking at a bug bounty program and a domain is not listed in the in scope section, it's automatically out of scope. That doesn't mean it'll remain out of scope because programs tend to add scope over time. So you can keep an eye out for future updates to see if there are new assets to test. So why is scope important? First of all, legal reasons. The scope helps set the legal and ethical boundaries for security research. By clarifying what is off limits, i.e. out of scope, organizations can avoid potential conflicts with laws and regulations. Researchers' integrity are provided safe harbor and will not face any legal action on the condition that they follow the program's rules. If you're in doubt about this, you can use the ask a scope question to clarify any questions you might have. Secondly, resource allocation. So some programs prefer to slowly expand their scope for a few reasons. They might need time to secure some assets and get them ready for testing. They might want to focus on critical assets first, and they might have limited funds available for bug bounty. So essentially, by directing their attention and their budget, organizations can focus the scope according to their goals and available resources. There are also practical reasons. So some systems are very sensitive to being tested, for example, critical infrastructure, and we don't want any unaware product teams being bombarded with payloads or unsolicited scans that might result in accidental denial of service. And finally, fairness. So focusing on assets that are out of scope and therefore less tested provides an unfair advantage to some bug bounty hunters. We want to make sure that people who respect the scope don't miss out on potential bounties. Okay, so I've moved over to the Integrity website, which has an example of how we can interpret what is in and out of scope. Here's rule number one, which is the most specific domain is the one that should be adhered to. For example, in this case, we have in scope is a wildcard.example.com, which basically means every possible subdomain, which could come before .example.com, is in scope. However, there is a more specific domain here, which is sub.example.com. So it's specifically saying that sub.example.com is out of scope. So it means that we'll basically follow that rule because it's a more specific domain. And here we can see the examples of saying sub.example.com is out of scope, but www.example.com is in scope, and another.sub.example.com is in scope. And then we have a second example here, which is giving us a specific in scope, which is sub.example.com and then out of scope is everything at example.com but because the in scope has a more specific domain here i.e not that wild card we can essentially say that sub.example.com is in scope but nothing else is the second rule that we have here is the wild card character applies to none one or more without limit subdomains and the example we have we've got a wild card before .sub.example.com which means that sub.example.com is in scope as well as another.sub.example. So we can add any word in place of this wildcard, providing it's not explicitly out of scope. But example.com is not in scope in this case because we specifically need to have that dot sub before example.com for it to be in scope. So can you submit out of scope bugs? Let's say you stumble upon a vulnerability on an out of scope domain. So you're not actively testing that domain, but perhaps during the course of your research, you inadvertently found some vulnerability and you're not sure whether or not to report it. You may still choose to disclose the vulnerability to the program, but most of the time, triage will reject these submissions as out of scope. When a submission is rejected as out of scope, the researcher does not receive a bounty nor reputation points, and it'll also negatively affect the validity ratio. This is important because valid ratio, among other parameters, determine if researchers are invited to private programs. So essentially, you are disincentivized from hunting out of scope, but there are cases where the triage team will still send out of scope submissions to clients if there is a clear business impact that the organization should be made aware of. Although there is no bounty for out of scope submissions, Organizations sometimes award a bonus or reputation points, depending on the situation. 
It's a fine line and a very contentious topic. We don't want to incentivize out of scope testing for obvious reasons that we outlined earlier in the presentation, but we also don't want to be responsible for failing to notify organizations of a serious known vulnerability. If you're in doubt, you can go onto the Integrity Knowledge Database and search for scope for more information. The next topic we want to talk about is duplicate bugs. So duplicates or dupes occur when multiple researchers report the same vulnerability. Organizations will reward whichever researcher reported the bug first. So quite often what will happen is somebody reports a vulnerability and while it's being triaged or remediated, somebody else finds that same vulnerability and reports it, which leads to a duplicate on behalf of the second person to report the vulnerability. That said, Knowingly reporting a duplicate is considered unethical because it wastes the triage team's time and the program's resources and ultimately can hurt your reputation as a researcher. That doesn't happen very often, but sometimes if two people are working on a bug bounty program, maybe the first person submits a vulnerability and because they're friends, the second person tries to do it as well to also get a bounty or some reputation points. And again, this is not considered ethical, and it does take up a lot of the triage team's time if you knowingly report these duplicates. Another important topic is structural issues. So there is a one fix, one reward policy, which means submissions can be marked as duplicates if they have the same underlying root cause in the code. So for example, if multiple fixes need to be applied, let's say there's two different endpoints and they both need a fix, that wouldn't be a duplicate, since the fix from the first report wouldn't prevent the second vulnerability from being found. However, if a single code change will fix the vulnerability on each endpoint, they would be marked as duplicates. When in doubt, just ask yourself whether the fix for the first report would have also fixed the other report as well. Next up, let's talk about the Community Code of Conduct. So this is available in full on the Integrity website on the Knowledge Database and we encourage you to familiarize yourself with it. But I'm gonna briefly go through each element, and I mean very briefly because there is quite a lot more information on the full code of conduct. But let's start off with disclosure terms. So we've talked about this in another one of the modules, but approval is required to disclose submissions to parties other than integrity and the concerned company. Disclosure of any submission related information without written approval is prohibited. Integrity supports research and collaboration on some programs, but you must refrain from sharing confidential information outside of the program, and collaboration with external individuals requires company approval. Asking for updates. So once a vulnerability has been triaged and it's been sent through to the affected organization, we request that you would wait 30 days before asking for an update, and we'll provide an update every 30 days on that request, even if there is no update from the affected organization. Please bear in mind that the size of the security team at these organizations will vary, as will the number of bugs in the queue. Out of scope submissions. So as we mentioned previously, the strict scope definition is for legal, practical, fairness, and focus reasons. But researchers may use the ask a scope question for clarification. And if researchers inadvertently find an out of scope bug, they may report it, but should not expect a bounty. It should go without saying, but Integrity expects ethical behavior from the community, including using licensed software. Out of bounds communications have been touched upon in other modules as well, but just to recap, all reports must be sent through the Integrity platform. Reaching out to customers directly is prohibited. Researchers should not privately hold vulnerabilities for extended periods of time without reporting and Integrity expects timely reporting, so within 48 hours of finding the vulnerability, unless it's part of a chain of vulnerabilities that you're trying to exploit. We ask that you limit exposure of personal data to the bare minimum. So for example, if you find a way to access user profiles, you shouldn't access the personal data of as many profiles as possible. If you find the vulnerability, report it as it is, and access the minimum amount of data required to verify the vulnerability. Also, follow the best standards for handling personal data and do not download, alter, or share it with third parties. Regarding third-party services, vulnerability reporting and hosting, we ask that you don't host proof of concepts or videos externally. 
they should be uploaded directly to the Integrity platform, or if that's not possible, they could be stored in a password protected zip and sent through in some other communication medium. Uh, this section of the Code of Conduct also gives guidelines for using third-party pen testing tools. So for example, things like XSS Hunter, where you might need to be careful about where your data is being stored and who has access to it. We ask that you be very cautious when conducting automated tests to prevent service degradation. So for example, limiting the amount of requests per second. And that's also very often part of the program requirements. So you need to go and check the details and see how many requests per second are you able to send when using automated tools. And then you'll need to go and look into the documentation of those tools to find out how you can adhere to that requirement. Pivoting is not allowed, so researchers must cease testing and report vulnerabilities when they gain access to restricted environments. For example, if you find a remote code execution vulnerability on a web server, you would report that vulnerability. You wouldn't proceed to enumerate the web server and try and find another way to pivot further into the network. Behavioral guidelines, I hope this goes without saying, but discriminatory, sexist, Offensive behavior and other harmful acts are prohibited, and researchers should strive to be polite, respectful, and understanding with triages, with clients, and with other researchers. Sanctions may be applied if you fail to adhere to the code of conduct, and the type of sanction will depend on the intent, the impact, and the frequency of the violation. Sanction types can include warnings, invitation restrictions, payment restrictions, and platform restrictions. You have a right to repeal any sanction every 30 days, and if needed, a group of independent experts from the University of Leuven will review the appeal. So what if you're restricted from a platform, but you have a vulnerability that you want to report? Well, we do encourage responsible disclosure, even when your account is restricted. That said, while your account is restricted, you're not authorized to test any in-scope assets. So yeah, if you're restricted from the platform and you start testing some program, even if you're in scope, you're not actually authorized to do so. Integrity complies with international laws and sanction lists. So individuals on sanction lists or from sanctioned countries might face some restrictions and Integrity performs a daily sanctions check on verified accounts. Finally, your tax and financial obligations. So this section of the Code of Conduct informs researchers about the tax and financial obligations in relation to bug bounty payments, and essentially advises that you comply with your local laws and regulations. So that has been a quick overview of the Code of Conduct. You can go to the Integrity Knowledge Database and search for Code of Conduct if you want to go through the full thing. I've just kind of briefly summarized each of these headings, but as you can see, there is quite a lot more information there if you want to read through the details, which again, we encourage you to do. You can also use this search bar to search for other things. If you want to search for something about scope or duplicate bugs or something like that, then you can find the information here. And if there's anything that's not available, any questions that you have apart from that, you can contact the community team. So you can email community at integrity.com. You can go and use one of these little message boxes on the website, or you can come on Discord. We have a bot which allows you to create tickets, which we'll be able to respond to. Something I didn't go through is the terms and conditions. So you also have to agree to this in order to hunt on the platform. And again, there's quite a lot of stuff in here. I'm not going to cover that in the presentation, but it's worth familiarizing yourself with some of the terms that you agree to when you want to look for bugs on the platform.